Resuming debate, the honourable member from Langley Aldergrove. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, people back at home in Langley, British Columbia, are asking me what is going on in Ottawa. Why has Parliament come to uh, a halt? What is the impasse? Uh, so soon into the fall session. And they're asking, so if the NDP tore up their supply and confidence agreement with the Liberals, uh, what happened there? Well, they discovered, the NDP discovered that hitching their wagon uh, to the Prime Minister's train wasn't really helping them very much where it really counts, and that is at the polls. Uh, and then the Bloc Québécois, you know, nature uh, abhors a vacuum, so the Bloc Québécois jumped in and started flirting with the Liberal government in the hope of maybe leveraging some favours, uh, but they too are finding out that uh, being closely aligned with this uh, Prime Minister in, his, in the waning days of his political career probably isn't all that good as a uh, political strategy. Now both these opposition parties are learning what has been obvious to the Conservative Party for a long, long time, and that is that this Prime Minister really has what resembles a Midas touch, or the opposite thereof. You know, King Midas got his wish that everything that he touched would turn into gold, uh, which was really cool for a little while until even his food started turning into gold and he was going to starve to death. Well, the Prime Minister has something similar. Everything that he touches gets tarnished and eventually falls apart in a so pile true. of dust. So true. There are a couple of examples. The We Charity, uh, which at one time was a functional charity here in Canada, very high profile, worked with school kids. It had the additional advantage of being closely aligned with the Prime Minister, some of his cabinet ministers, and some, some of their family members. Uh, so the Prime Minister thought he would reciprocate that friendship by, um, giving, by selecting We Charity without any competition at all to distribute almost $1 billion of COVID relief money. Now, it was a short-lived golden moment uh, for this charity that ended up when all the conflicts became public. The harm was done. They shut their doors. Their history, no thank you, no thanks to the Prime Minister. Now, SNC Lavalin, and another example, it was a profitable engineering and construction company with big projects right across this country and around the world. Now, they made mistakes, admittedly, but if the Prime Minister had just left them alone, they would still be a thriving company today. Uh, his uh, then Attorney General, Jody Wilson Raybould, Canada's first Indigenous Attorney General, uh, had one idea based on the professional advice she was getting. Uh, as to how to prosecute this company. But the Prime Minister had quite a different idea, so he fired his Prime Minister, uh, his Attorney General. Think of that, Canada's self-declared feminist Prime Minister firing Jody Wilson-Raybould, Canada's female Attorney General and first ever Indigenous uh, Attorney General. I read her autobiography, as I hope that everybody has, because it's very informative. And she says in there, quite frankly, I wish I had never met the Prime Minister. She told him right to his face, and uh, Mr. Speaker, there are many other people who have been too closely associated with the Prime Minister who failed the same. Another example would be uh, Governor General, former Governor General David Johnson, a man with a huge reputation in Canada for the services that uh, he has provided to uh, his nation. Uh, he was appointed to the Honourable Member from Edmonton Strathcona is rising on a point of order. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I would like to request that you, that you look through the chamber. It appears that we do not have quorum to continue on this debate. We have quorum. Do you count? Maybe not. Maybe you can't. Indeed, indeed, the honourable member is correct. I thank the honourable member, and the bells will be rung.
At this point, we do have quorum in the House. Order, please. Order, please. The Honourable Member uh, from Langley Aldergrove uh, has 16 minutes and five seconds left on the clock. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I was, uh, I was uh, sharing with uh, the audience here, the now expanding audience, uh, about some of the uh, travesty that the Prime Minister has wreaked upon uh, great institutions and also great people like uh, uh, David Johnson, the former uh, Governor General of this country, a man with a huge reputation until the Prime Minister appointed him as Special Rapporteur on foreign interference into our elections, our democratic institutions. That appointment was despite uh, the close ties that Mr. Johnson had with the Trudeau family and the Trudeau Foundation, a foundation that had received funds from a foreign nation which was going to be the subject of the investigation. Now, maybe <laughs> this obvious conflict of interest wasn't immediately obvious to our um, high school drama teacher prime minister, but it sh certainly should have been uh, obvious to uh, highly educated uh, David Johnson. Unfortunately, he didn't get it, he didn't understand it, or he turned a blind eye to it. Uh, Anyways, at the end, he resigned another fatality of this Prime Minister's golden touch. Now, I could go on and on with other, other examples. I could mention the Winnipeg Lab affair, the Arrive Camp scam, the billionaire island scandal. Uh, some of my colleagues have raised those already. I'm not going to belabor the point other than to relate this back to the question of the day, what happened to Sustainable Development Technology Canada? SDTC, or better known now, uh, now known by its uh, new nickname, the Liberal Party Green Slush Fund. What happened there? A little bit of history, SDTC, I'm going to call it, was created by an act of parliament back in the Liberal Prime Minister John Cretchen days to promote investment in green technology, uh, a laudable objective. It continues its work under Prime Minister Stephen Harper and likely would be thriving today if the current Prime Minister had just left it alone, but he could not resist the temptation of firing the people who were there and putting his own friends in place instead. That's what went wrong there. Uh, friends that sat on the board and despite conflicts of interest, distributed money amongst themselves, insiders helping other insiders, liberal friends helping each other. Now we know all of this from the independent auditor's report number six, which he tabled in Parliament on June 4th, 2024, just a couple of weeks before the House rose for the summer break. It is highly critical of what was happening at SDTC. Some examples from the report, and I'm not going to get into the detail because the report is public information. Uh, $390 million of misallocated dollars, taxpayer funds, that were granted to insiders or to non-qualifying projects. This is insiders on the board of directors supporting each other in their app, uh, grant applications. <coughs> 186 examples of conflict of interest, board members voting for each other's applications. The Auditor General learned about this from a whistleblower. Uh, and this is what one of, the, one of those whistleblowers told the committee that is now looking into it, the Standing Parliamentary Committee. Uh, and I quote from their testimony. Just as I was always confident that the Auditor General would confirm the financial mismanagement of SDTC, I remain equally confident that the RCMP will uh, substantiate the criminal activities that occurred within the organization. So there you have it, Mr. P Mr. Speaker. It's not just mismanagement, but it's criminality. So we, the official opposition, the Conservative Party, did what we were elected to do, holding this government to account and uncovering corruption where there's smoke, there's fire. So we're doing our job. We uh, put forward a motion shortly after the auditor's report was tabled. I'm just going to read a small little piece of it that the House order the government, Sustainable Development Technology Canada, and the Auditor General each to deposit with the law clerk and the Parliamentary Council within 30 days of the adoption of this order the following documents related 
or dated since, related to or dated since January 1, 2017. Now the order goes on to describe what some of those documents are, the different types, uh, um, uh, and the different categories. This conservative motion passed a little while later, June 10th, 2024, with the support of the other opposition parties, the NDP and the Bloc Québécois. Only Liberal members of Parliament voted against it. Now, I know that the Liberals are not happy with the order, but this is the reality of a minority house. This is the way it works. They don't have a majority. They need to play nice with and get support from one of the opposition parties. They failed to do that, and they are now stuck with this order that they say they don't like. Well, too bad. Parliament is supreme. Parliament made that order. The Liberal Party must now comply with it. The governing party doesn't have a choice not to comply with it. Uh, and that, Mr. Speaker, is what happened. We all got, uh, nothing happened during the summer. The doc, some of the documents got delivered, but not all. Clearly, the order was not complied with. Uh, and we got back here in uh, September after the summer break, and things started to get very ugly. On the first day, day back uh, in the House, our House leader, the member for Regina Capel, rose on a question of privilege, quote, concerning the failure of the government to comply with the order that the House adopted on Monday, June 10th. Now, I don't have to repeat anything in the House Leader's speech. It's enhanced for anybody uh, who is interested in reading it. I can tell you that it is well-researched, it is well-written, and it's convincing. As a matter of fact, Mr. Speaker, it convinced you. Uh, and a couple of days later, you made your ruling. Uh, the ruling confirms the earlier order. The Prime Minister's office and all relevant government departments must comply with the original document production order as demanded, unredacted. The Liberal House Leader has been leading a valiant but ultimately failing charge against this document production order and the speaker's ruling. Now, she raises several interesting but specious constitutional arguments, and here I would summarize it as follows. Number one, the document production order uh, trespasses on the charter right of freedom from unreasonable search and seizure, section eight of the charter. Number two, the document production order exceeds the authority of the House by attempting to secure documents for a third party, namely the RCMP. Uh, and third, the document production order is unconst an unconstitutional attempt by the House of Commons uh, to appropriate the role of another branch of government, namely the judiciary. All interesting and creative arguments, but in my submission, ineffective, and a little late in the day, as far as the speaker was concerned. In his words, in his ruling, he said, the chair would suggest respectfully that these concerns should have been raised prior to the motion's adoption. Well, you know, the first thing that we learned in law school uh, was that if you're going to be uh, pr uh, present in court, you better get all the evidence in, all the facts, and all your arguments before the judge makes his ruling, not afterwards. It's too late. The speaker came to the reasonable con conclusion that the document production order of a couple of months uh, earlier stands that it was not followed, and that the Liberals are wrong, wrong, wrong. The Prime Minister's office must comply with the document production order. Now, a couple of quotes from, the, from your ruling, Mr. Speaker. Uh, the House has the undoubted right to order the production of any and all documents from any individual or entity it deems necessary to uh, carry out its duties. These powers are a settled matter at least as far as the House is concerned. They have been confirmed and reconfirmed by immediate pre predecessors, as well as those more distantly removed. And the chair cannot come to any other conclusion but to find that a prima facie question of privilege has been established. That's the ruling. And that means that the government must comply and the Prime Minister's office, the PMO, must make it clear to the departments that the House order ought to be complied with fully. And I know the Liberals aren't happy with this, with the original motion or with the ruling. 
but I think it's important, it, it, you know, and they say, well, it's, un, it's unusual. This is not normal course of business. Well, maybe so, but it is a ruling of the House, and the House is supreme, and they can make this order, as the uh, Speaker has ruled. And I think it's important to highlight uh, at this time that the other two opposition parties, the NDP and the Bloc Québécois, speakers have both noted that while the order might be unusual, that, that fact does not excuse non-compliance. And I would underline that. There is no excuse for non-compliance. Experts agree with that position. Uh, I'm going to quote from Bosk and Gagnon, experts in this field, House of Commons Practice and Procedures. I'm reading from the third edition, uh, 2017, at page 985. <clears throat> which talks about the Parliament's right to order the production of documents. And I quote, no statute or practice diminishes the fullness of that power rooted in House privileges unless there is an explicit provision to that effect, or unless the House adopts a specific resolution limiting that power. The House has never set a limit on its power to order the production of papers and records. So there you go, Mr. Speaker, the uh, production order stands. It has a, an ancient history that Parliament can do this, uh, and the Prime Minister refuses to comply, and that is why we are at an impasse. That's why things have gone to a halt, and until it is resolved, nothing will be debated but this issue. Now, the Liberals blame it on us, and I'm saying you need to comply with the orders. Uh, Canadians want to know, what is in those documents? What are they hiding? I think that's really the fundamental question. What are they worried about? The, now, uh, the Speaker, Mr. Speaker, you were trying to be helpful, and you suggested that maybe all the parties could just send this off to the committee uh, and have a look at it there. Uh, but you do note correctly in my submission that, quote, it is ultimately for the House to decide how it wishes to proceed. The House has decided. The House has ordered production of the documents. The Prime Minister and the Liberal Party must comply. Now, the way I see it, Mr. Speaker, they have three choices. They can comply with the order, which I think is what we've been saying all along for the last nine days, or number two, they can sue the Speaker. I know you won't take that personally. Uh, they've done that before. Uh, they, can, uh, they can challenge your ruling based on all the specious arguments that they have put forward uh, already. Or they can ask the Governor General to, to dissolve the 44th Parliament and call an election. This is what we've been calling all, all along. Now, but my preference. Number one is obviously the simplest and the cleanest. We just comply with the order and we get on with business. We can then send it to committee. Or number two, the most interesting, really would be to sue the speaker. The liberals have done in the, this in the past and then they changed their mind and dissolved parliament and called an election. Well, I can tell you as a as a student of constitutional law and Canadian history, I think that would be the most interesting. Let's go ahead and do it. Uh, see if the Supreme Court will even take the case on. And if they do, it's going to make great Canadian history. Uh, now the, number three would be the best for Canada, and that is simply to dissolve this parliament, call an election. Uh, and I can tell you, Mr. Speaker, I spoke to a lot of people in my riding back at home during the summer months, and this is what they're calling for. Go call the election. Call it now as soon as possible. This is what people want uh, because they deserve a government that will stop the corruption, that will fix what the Liberals have broken, and that will offer common sense solutions to the problems facing ordinary Canadians today. Canadians deserve a government that will axe the tax, build the homes, fix the budget, and stop the crime. Here, here. Canadians deserve a government that doesn't play favorites with their insiders, and where non-insiders can work hard and get ahead. Canadians deserve a Canada that delivers on its promise to all who call it home, that hard work earns powerful paychecks and pensions, that buy affordable homes on safe streets in a country where anyone from anywhere can accomplish anything. Mr. Speaker, all of this is possible, but first, the Prime Minister has to call an election. Do it now.